Hi, folks. We're here with the auto-inflammatory Stills Disease IL-1 focused panel. This is a group of room now faculty where we're covering the meeting specifically focused on auto-inflammatory issues and Stills Disease in kids and adults, but also other infl inflammatory conditions. And I'm joined today by Bella Meta in New York City, Olga Petrina in New York City, Yuz Yusuf, who's in Leeds, the UK, and Rachel Tate, who's in Florida, at, in Fort Lauderdale specifically. Um, and folks, thank you very much for uh, all that you've covered this week, really a large volume of uh, tweets and, and uh, written articles and videos. I think you've all done a fabulous job. I'm gonna ask our panel to uh, basically introduce the uh, one abstract that they'd like to talk about. Uh, and let's start with uh, Rachel. Sure, thanks Jack. Um, well, number one, I think this was a really good convergence for all of us. We, there was a lot to talk about, and I know we have a lot to do. So I want to bring up one small study. It is abstract number 1100. It's a small French study, only 13 patients, but they reviewed pulmonary artery hypertension as it relates to adult onset stills disease. And I'll cut right to the chase, but really what they found in these only 13 patients is that while pulmonary artery hypertension is very rare in adult onset stills disease. We need to be worried about females because it only affected these particular women. So obviously we need further studies, but to me, this just was something that I don't think about and talk about with my patients probably enough. And so that was my favorite abstract of today. I like that study for several reasons. One, um, the author list included Jacques Bouchot and Bruno Fartrell, who've been writing and doing a lot about Stills disease over the years. And congratulations to them to, to doing something that I wish I had done. And I think we have all, um, if you see enough Stills disease, real Stills disease, you've seen a few cases of this. And the question is, why is it occurring? In their cohort, kind of mirrored what my experience is. The patients who get pulmonary hypertension with Stills, number one is after Stills, right? Two, it could be when they're active with stills. And three, it happened in my cases in patients who are on steroids and on an IL-1 inhibitor. In their 13 patients, 69% were on an IL-1 inhibitor, 100% were on steroids. I wanna ask our others in the panel, have you seen PAH in stills patients? I actually did ha have two patients, one unfortunately deceased and what I learned from my clinical experience is that pulmonary hypertension in stills is not a good prognostic sign. Usually patients who develop pH have active disease, polycyclic disease, uh, refractory disease, and their outcomes are not as good as patients without this condition. It's so, tricky, Olga, your patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension, did they both uh, confirm with um, you know, the cardiac catheterization? Yeah, right heart cath. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. I yeah. mean, like five of these patients died. So out of the 13 yeah. that they, and they surveyed the whole country um, and all they could find was females. So I wonder, I mean, now I'm just looking back at all these patients I've seen. Were they all females? Olga, were both of yours females? They were. They mine, were, were. mine were females too. Now, again, yeah. I want to caution you because uh, anybody that wants to learn about Stills disease, just read two papers. Eric Bywater is 1971, annals rheumatic disease. He had 13 women with Stills disease. The second paper, 1973, Journal of Medicine, Joseph Bujak, the lead author from the NIH, had 10 males with Stills disease. That was the early argument. This is a male disease, female disease. It seems to be a young person. So you need a bigger sample size, but it does, as Rachel says, does seem suspicious that females are, are and, and, and amongst us were sort of describing the same uh, profiled female mm -hmm. and not doing well. And uh, Olga, yours were on um, on IL-1 inhibitors, true? Correct. They were on IL-1, IL-6, steroids. Actually, both of them were not able to taper off steroids. So I think, again, it may have had something to do with the development of this complication, uh, or maybe they do require a lot of steroid because of the severity of the disease. So it's hard to tell. And then what I found interesting, uh, what reflects my experience is in this particular study, 12 out of 13 patients had polycyclic disease. So it's, we don't see it in patients with articular disease. We see mostly patients with severe systemic manifestations. Rachel, what was the survival in those patients? Oh my goodness. Well, as Bella mentioned already, the survival was, I mean, it wasn't very good. 
the patient was like 36 percent died i mean yeah like five of died. The 13, i mean died exactly like immediately so, within, within like the two or three years follow-up they had so right and unfortunately it doesn't really share the um for the survivors, the patients that really, were they still refractory? Were they still having worsening right. of their PAH? You know, there's a lot to be, there's a lot that we still don't understand um, as we've talked before. So yeah, it wasn't good. I think, I mean, a couple of years ago, I did a study using 10 years US data uh, and there was um, like about thousands of stills patients, but the PAH rate was like 0.3 or something percent mm -hmm. and that's why I didn't even further analyze it but now since I have the data I'll go back and look at it uh saying because you know sometimes it's so small that you feel like you don't want to make huge conclusions but, but will you have sex and age and yes and I have that I have that so you'll know the answer better than anyone very very soon use your question um because I've never seen anyone you know with pa in, in still disease I mean what will you do I mean do you throw away like you know endothelial receptor antagonist like placenta or something to, into the regimen or what do you do have to treat in their study 77 percent were on drugs like that for PAH um they say the survival was pretty much the same as survival for PAH without stills disease um, they, the rheumatologist did change from using no IL-6 inhibitors to a third of the patients going IL-6 inhibitors and a bunch of them went on IL-1 and they were all on steroids, probably for the polycyclic disease that Olga was mentioning. So it is futile, um, but is it the beginning of the end? I mean, at that time you're desperate, right? You're going to try yeah. everything. Right. Okay. Let's move on to another one. Uh, Bella. Um, I think I like the abstract number 1062, which was uh, using telemedicine in uh, autoinflammatory diseases. So I have seen a lot of patients um, who don't get diagnosed for years because they go from one center to the other and there's no proper referral sometimes. And this, uh, this I like the abstract because what they did was they empowered the providers who are like primary care pediatrics who are the first point of contact for these patients and then gave them access to an auto-inflammatory disease specialist. So somebody who has a little more experience with this um, and, and that they could call them when the patient is with them, uh, call like a specialist. And I think they, they show feasibility and that um, you know, physicians uh, in the primary care setting or uh, as a first point of contact near the patient's home, um, they they want to use this. So I think, and again, with COVID, everything like telemedicine has like exponentially increased. Um, a lot of, there's a, a lot of, a lot more uptake in patients and physicians alike. Uh, and I th think I liked the abstracts showing feasibility of this concept. It's kind of brilliant if you think about it, because um, Rachel and I are working on the Stills Now website and thinking about how we're going to find a referral network for the person in, you know, Rockford, Illinois, and the person who's in Nottingham, England, and whatever. And, you know, every, there really are few people who are great at this, you know, telemedicine might be a real smart way to get real sick pa patients in front of someone who really knows the disease. Um, and then they can integrate with the people locally and make them into experts just through experience. It's a really neat idea. Um, anyone and else have a, another uh, extension of this? I guess just one thing saying, um, and there'll be a provider right there. So it's not like you'll miss a huge physical exam finding. There will be somebody who's examined the patient too. So, so you know, sort of uh, another guardrail. <laughs> I thought right. that was actually the most brilliant part of this was not only did they integrate telemedicine with a specialist, they also had another physician who cares for that patient, knows that patient to kind of elaborate. So the patient's not stuck having, well, I think I may have had uh, neutropenia or maybe I did have fevers, you know, so there was some continuity there for the patient. It was brilliant. I like this study too, Bella. Who, who gets the 99204? Oh, I don't know. That's our that's, probably, use, that's, a tough use, point. Use, that's our coding for a full visit. And, you know, this is all about money, I guess, at some point. But it, it's a very cool idea. And it really is one of the great things that we could learn from COVID. The Cleveland Clinic for years actually has been doing remote telehealth um, consults. You know, Lenny Cal Calabres can't see all the primary CNS patients in the world, but he, he and, a, and a few colleagues do see a number of them 
via telehealth as a way of, you know, uh, I guess weeding through a lot of patients who are not going to have um, more easily diagnosed conditions and get down, getting down to the ones that need to come in and have more extensive evaluations. Let's move on. Yuz, you had a, an interesting one? Yeah, so um, so we've got to speak about Vexus. Um, so, um, you know, Vexus was it took this 10 center stage last year when it was first introduced. So it make everyone thinking, oh, have I got a patient with Vexus that we've not been diagnosed? So, um, you know, one year from last year, um, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, how the, you know, progress in research, you know, have been. Um, so the abstract was an oral presentation. Um, the number is 1426. So basically, these were the original NIH court that were reported last year, but then um, they've increased, you know, with in, to include international, you know, multi-center studies. So overall, they had like, 84 patients with vexels, you know, since, since last year. Um, and then um, what they've done, so there were, there were three genetic variants, and then they tried to compare the clinical symptoms if it, you know, if it's unique to each variant. So what they found, um, you know, people who have, um, oh, this pardon me for a bit, so it's P-met, it's in the vowel. Uh, so basically, if you have that variant, so basically you are most likely to have um, so in a fever uh, and also low uh, relapsing polychondritis uh, rate. Whereas if you have another one called P Med uh, Liu, uh, you're more likely to have Sweet Syndrome. So that's one interesting thing about the you know variability heterogeneity in terms of the manifestation based on the genetic variants. Next one, the important one they, they look is because uh, they look at the mortality. So the median mortality was about ten years. Uh, and they're trying to find the predictors of mortality. So um, what they found, if you have that, so, you know, that variant, which is the PMET41 vowel, um, and also if you are tra transfusion dependent, so you are, you know, have a higher chances of, you know, you know of, of time to death. Uh, uh, while if you have ear uh, chondritis, that seemed to be protective. So it's quite interesting, like, you know, from last year to now, they could even try to predict, you know, you know, you know the poor pronostic uh, patients. Yeah, that um, that valine substitution at uh, position 41 is uh, is lethal. Those people did not leave, uh, live. And um, again, Dr. Ferrada from the NIH did a fabulous job presenting the data, um, making it really understandable. And then she um, answered the questions about how do I diagnose this? And she said, well, they're working on a gen genetic testing. That's one thing. And then she offered the clinical clues of, you know, having a high MCV greater than 100 and a platelet, uh, low platelet count, um, I guess, speaks to the hematologic aspects of these disorders. The other thing I thought that was interesting is they looked at a cohort of relapsing polychondritis patients. And I have a slide here, 8% of them had vexus with an RP um, presentation. So that goes to something we we're talking about earlier in that, you know, if you look for that, that um, RP variant, that relapsing polychondritis, you're, you might find a healthy number of vexus in our, in our recap. Um, the, someone asked the question, how likely is a, you know, community rheumatologist gonna, uh, uh, to see a case of vexus? That's kind of a good number for you. Everyone's got two, three, four, Collapsing polychondritis is patients, and 8% of those um, could have this, and maybe you have a better way of diagnosing this. Has, uh, has anyone seen Vexus yet? I have not. No. So there's a joke around um, one of my mentors in Florida, Mike Schweitz, says, um, well, I may not have seen Vexus, but it's probably seen me. And I think that's kind of how we can think about it in a way too, that we need to be educating ourselves so that we know if we do end up seeing it in the future, we don't miss it again. That's scary. Well, this case is from Leeds because uh, Dr. Sinisha Savage, she was an immunologist. So he's the second author in that abstract. So, um, so well, he has captured it because he has got this auto-inflammatory clinic. So but I've not seen personally myself. Wow. Well, yeah, I don't know what I don't know, but it's about time I started knowing more about it. So. Um, Olga, what's your favorite uh, uh, auto-inflammatory uh, presentation here? I really enjoyed the abstract 252, which speaks about potential laboratory markers that could uh, help differentiate a flare of auto-inflammatory conditions as opposed to infection. And I think it's important because it changes the whole treatment paradigm in those patients. 
And uh, so far, nothing seems to be very exciting, like CRP, ferritin, procalcitonin levels don't seem to be predictive in general. We still rely mainly on manifestations of the disease clinical diagnosis. The only utility of procalcitonin is really when it's really high, like when the levels grow 0.95 nanogram per ml or higher, that's a reliable predictor of MAS. So I think it's good to keep it in mind and, uh, you know, screen those patients who are at uh, high risk for this potentially fatal complication. So procalcitonin is part of the uh, S100 protein family that behaves in a, I think, like a, as a acute phase reactant. It's, you know, I've only known it to be used in stool samples in GI as a biomarker for what's going on with inflammation in Crohn's, but can we easily get serum procalcitonin levels? We actually can, and then now it's used quite often in uh, inpatient setting to diagnose patients with infection, because again, it also is elevated in, in cases of sepsis, pneumonia, you name it. Uh, so I think per se, it's not really useful because it just means a high inflammatory uh, response. I think the usefulness only when it's really, really high, then it becomes, but yeah, it's easy. You can order it easily as an inpatient marker. Yeah. Yeah, in, in the United Kingdom, um, we can only use procalcitonin when patient was admitted to a and &E, mm -hmm. emergency, when they do have like, suspect sepsis. So that's the only thing that you can you know, right. order it. Uh, and then they can guide, you know, when do you want to treat someone with antibiotics. So I think that's the only use, you know. Use, what's the turnaround time for your procalcitonin? It was quite quick, actually. Yeah, for a few yeah. hours. So yeah, it will be quite Yeah, helpful. same here in the U.S. So, you know, that it, you at least have some hopeful utility potentially with this, as long as it's a high level, as Olga was mentioning. All right, I'm going to end with um, another uh, abstract from Fautrell. Uh, and this one was about the use of JAK inhibitors in refractory cases of um, uh, adult and juvenile stills. It was eight cases total. The abstract number is 0195. Um, they had eight patients. Uh, they were uh, six adult, two systemic onset JIAs, um, and they had a fairly long disease duration. These cases were refractory with a disease duration of um, like seven or eight years. Um, almost all of them were um, polycyclic systemics, um, and they were treated with a variety of JAK inhibitors. It wasn't one. Uh, and that included baricitinib, bupatacitinib, tofa, and even ruxolotinib, which is generally used for just myelofibrosis. The interesting thing here is, and quite in contrast to the literature, I've published a number of small case series and individual cases on room now where it looks like JAK inhibitors may work. My own experience, I've used JAK inhibitors to treat MAS, um, either as they have MAS or as a follow-up to MAS after they get off of in patient hospitalized infusions of, um, uh, um, uh, what are the VP16? What are the uh, hematologists use? I can't remember now. Toposide and-, and Yeah, toposide, uh, VP16 uh, and, and, or, or cyclosporin. I use M uh, the, the, so I'm kind of high on the whole idea of Jack and Hibbers. Well, this report of their eight patients says one, there were no remissions in these refractory patients. Two, there was a 50% um, partial response rate at 11 months. And nobody could get off steroids. Yes. So right. it didn't help too much. Yeah. Well, it did decrease no. by 62% the steroid use, but still, yes, none of them were able to discontinue steroids completely. So my enthusiasm for JAX is now tempered, appropriately mm -hmm. so, by a negative report. Thank you to Dr. Fortrell. And I think we bottom line is the companies that make these drugs should be going into this this unmet need area. I mean, they're they're jumping all in on you know alopecia universalis and every skin disease known to man. Um, why not get into something where uh, again the drug would be a, a major advance if it if it could be added to our current arsenal, which is steroids, 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 IL one, IL six, and some methotrexate. We do need more than that, um, and that's that, that that's a bit major concern. Does anybody else use jack inhibitors at all? in systemic uh, JIA, adult or children? Okay. Never had experience. Mm -hmm. I've considered using it because, you know, what happens when, you know, methotrexate is not working and then IL-1, IL-6 are not working and you're trying to think of options. Uh, 
but you know now patients are also worried with jack so that gets... i want to caution the audience not to go after tnf inhibitors if the patient has systemic disease fever rash serositis you know high ferritins high crp high sed rate um chronic arthritis fine treat it just like it's ra but um, TNF inhibitors generally don't work in, in systemic disease. Um, if you're stuck, you know, you might, but I really wouldn't recommend it. Rachel? Jack, in your patients, did you, I just can't remember. I remember a patient that we had that was on a Jack. Were they monotherapy? Because again, this study also did not suggest that monotherapy option with a Jack was a good, good choice for these patients either. The last patient I used it on was on, interestingly, was on Ectemra. Um, IV mm. and the drug company refused to pay for it. And, and after a long time and he was starting to flare uh, and with systemic disease m- allowed him to go on sub Q and like two weeks later, he's in the hospital with full blown MAS mm-hmm. and he received um, like, I don't know, a brief course of etoposide. And then was kicked out of the hospital. They didn't have any insurance, whatever. Anyway, he ended up going on. Um, this is a fictional patient, by the way, because it was a real patient. I'd have to report this to the FDA. So, yeah, fictional patient. Um, I would have put him on um, samples of a JAK inhibitor uh, as an outpatient. Um, and he would have done well. That particular fictional patient would have done well on monotherapy. But I think uh, as... Dr. Mehta says, as you're questioning that from that study, you know, maybe you can't be on just one drug. You know, this is a highly complex inflammatory disease. Um, and that's why people are often on methotrexate steroids and a biologic, and they may not always do great. So these can be very challenging cases. Thank Let's you for sharing your hypothetical. Yeah, the hypothetical patients. Um, uh, Anybody have any other short takeaways from the world of auto inflammation and ACR21? I like the fact that COVID-19 outcomes, there was an uh, an abstract talking about COVID-19 outcomes in auto-inflammatory diseases, Uh, basically saying that, you know, all uh, all of the abstracts about COVID-19 and lupus, RA, everybody's like, oh, they're doing worse. They say, Seems like oh, this was the only sort of positive spin to this thing. They probably did, did okay, even with COVID-19. Um, yeah, Bella, this was abstract 1083, just for reference. I thought that was really good too. No change in flare frequency with COVID-19 patients um, who also had an inflammatory, auto-inflammatory disease. And then majority of those patients had mild to moderate symptoms and only a third had lingering COVID symptoms, period. So in terms of long haul information, I thought that was really good, good for us to see, you know, we need some win in this particular subset of patients. So that was a good thing. You know, my win was my patients during COVID. They all did really, 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 really well. And I'm just being reminded by these literature reports that are selecting down to Patients who are not well controlled, especially patients with lupus who are not well controlled. And then a few drugs seem to be pretty damning. I would bet that those, those auto-inflammatory patients who got COVID um, were just well controlled and taking drugs that have been shown to probably work in, in COVID, whether it's uh, a JAK inhibitor or an IL-1 inhibitor or an IL-6 inhibitor. I mean, I think that that is probably reason. And this, I think mainly being uninflamed yourself um, and, and also since auto-inflammatory tends to be fairly young, mm-hmm. you know, younger patients definitely yeah. do much better in COVID than do uh, the elderly. Any final comments, any suggestions? If not, we'll end it there. Thanks to our panel for contributing um, this knowledge and information and their coverage of auto-inflammation at ACR21. Be sure to tune in to more uh, videos and teachings on roomnow.com.